Father, thy chastening hand is laid in heavy weight upon each heart, and took our loved one to her rest. Alas, from her how can we part? No more she'll greet us when we come with joyous smile and clasping hand. No more her kind, unselfish acts in blessings sweet fall on our band. But then again, to her no more shall sickness come or sorrows frown. In faith and hope she bore life's cross. In peace and rest she wears the crown. Why should we weep for her, the true, the pure, the good, now glorified? Because she walks with us no more, life's changing values and streams beside. Blessed flowers of faith with fragrance sweet, guide to the home where she is gone. And Father, in thy boundless love, teach us to say, thy will be done. Welcome to Peek into Paintings. I am Gina Ganskop with Penobscot Marine Museum in Searsport, Maine. In this program, we're going to examine this painting. We don't often do portraits of people in our Peek into Paintings program, so this will be a little different and exciting. We'll start by examining the person in the middle of the painting. We see a woman standing with one hand rested on a chair. The light catches her face turned toward her left and caught in a Mona Lisa smile. She's not noticeably tan, but not pale either. Her dark eyes stare off into the distance. There's a touch of rosy color in her cheeks and her lips are a light pink. The one ear we can see is ornamented with a single drop earring. It could be a pearl or a dime sized metal pendant. Her long, wavy brown hair is parted at the middle and twisted up to be piled at the back of her head. Long ringlets fall down her back. Over her hair is a long white veil held in place by a crown of flowers. The largest flowers are no bigger than a quarter. They are all shades of white with green stems and small leaves. She is wearing a white ensemble. Today we'd probably describe it as a dress but it is actually lightly made up of several separate parts. The cloth is bright and shiny, and there are many details, including ruffles, lace, and flowers. The top, known as a bodice, has a high collar. There is gauzy lace high around her neck, and also a layer of ruffles just a little lower. Instead of a necklace or brooch, at her neck she has a delicate cluster of flowers that match the crown of flowers on her head. Again, there's mostly white flowers with some green leaves and stems. The bodice has a row of large buttons from her neck to her waist. Rows of ruffles decorate the bodice on both sides of the buttons at her waist. The bodice continues a few more inches, but is unbuttoned and separates, giving the look a little more texture and depth. Because of the way the bodice continues past the waist, it is called a basque. The sleeves have rows of ruffles similar to the rows running over the chest. The sleeves end about three quarters of the way down the arm with a cuff of extra ruffles, plus a large bow of the same material on the outside of the arm, and several inches of delicate lace that extend the sleeves almost to the wrists. The floor length skirt is made of the same material as the bodice and is visually plainer. The skirt is not tight to her body, but doesn't provide a lot of room for movement either. From the front, the bottom is not much fuller than the top is around her hips. We see just a hint of fabric in the back, which suggests there is a bustle, and the dress continues into a long train behind her. Four tucks drape the fabric from about the middle of her thigh to below her knees, if we could see her legs. At the lowest part of the tucks, more fabric is caught up in a large bow. A sprig of four flowers and draped stems or vines with small leaves further accentuate the bow. At the bottom of the dress, extending the hem, is an edging of small ruffles. Her right toe peeks out from under the dress. Her left hand, with a gold band on one finger, holds a lacy handkerchief. On the chair at her right, we also see a pair of long white gloves and a white fan unfolded to show its gauzy decorations. The wooden chair that her hand is resting on has embroidered upholstery with large flowers in white, pink, and red. She is standing near the arched entrance to another room. We see to her left what appears to be the side of a window, including the curtains at the top. On her right, there are 
drape poles that may have been used to close drapes dividing the two spaces. Behind her, there is a wooden table with marble top. The legs of the table are elaborately carved into a shape resembling a foot. The top may be circular, but instead of a smooth circle, the sides have additional curves. On top of the table rests a stone pedestal. Two naked young children are carved into the base. The top of it holds a large bouquet of flowers. Greenery drapes down over the stone children and also mingles between pink, red, and yellow roses and other flowers in yellow, white, and purple. Finally, the last thing we see in, in this painting is a painting. In an elaborate gold frame, we see a formal portrait of a man. A vine of green leaves decorates the frame. His brown hair is parted at the side, smoothed close to his head with long sideburns. His gaze, like hers, is to the left. His long mustache hides his mouth. He wears a black suit, white shirt, and a tie at his neck. Now that we've taken a close look at the painting, what do you think it is a painting of? Does it tell a story on its own? You may have guessed that she is in her wedding dress. The veil, white color, and other details all suggest it is a wedding ensemble. White wedding dresses became popular after Queen Victoria wore white at her wedding to Prince Albert in 1840. Around that time, the Industrial Revolution also made, made white fabric more available. After Queen Victoria's wedding, white wedding dresses became more popular, but it still wasn't uncommon for a woman to wear the best dress she had, or even to reuse her dress after her wedding. This dress looks like it was made especially for this occasion. If you're familiar with 19th century fashion, you also may have guessed what decade this bride is in. The shape of the dress with the high neckline natural waist, basque, narrow skirt in the front, and bustle in the back all suggest the, the 1870s. We have one more clue about this painting, which is the small plaque at the base of the painting. It reads, Harriet McGilvery Dunbar, 1853 to 1875. The marriage of Harriet Hitchborn to William McGilvery in 1837 united the two wealthiest families of Stockton Springs and Searsport. Their daughter Harriet was born on August 19, 1853. In 1875, Harriet married a Searsport sea captain, Norman Dunbar, and went to sea with him on her honeymoon aboard the brig H.H. Wright. She died on this trip in what is now Poland on October 28, 1875 at the age of 22. In the Victorian era, death was more a part of life than it is today. Consider that today the vast majority of people die in hospitals. In the 19th century, most people died in the home. In Searsport in particular, one of the unfortunate realities of a maritime community was the high number of people lost at sea, whether to disease, accident, or drowning. Victorian etiquette included strict social customs for mourning, including how to behave and what to wear. Victorian customs also sought ways to remember loved ones who have passed or are far away. The photograph was still relatively new technology and allowed the instant capture of a person's likeness. Paintings were also still popular. It is unclear why a wedding portrait was not done at the time of Harriet McGilvery and Norman Dunbar's wedding ceremony. Sometime after her death, Harriet's sister posed for this painting wearing Harriet's wedding gown. Harriet's face was painted in from a photograph. The portrait on the wall in the background is of Norman Dunbar, her husband. It seems odd today, perhaps it even seemed odd at the time, but this tactic enabled the family to have this beautiful painting to hang in their homes remembering Harriet for generations. The painting is unsigned. It has been attributed to local artist Dolly Smith. She painted both of Harriet's parents, making it even more likely she painted this one. Beyond photographs and paintings, another way Victorians remembered each other was through exchanging locks of hair. Victorian hair art combined a cultural interest in nature with protocols for mourning and remembering. Loose hair was given as gifts or removed after death and arranged into works, from a small, small piece of jewelry to elaborate wreaths, like this one. The beautiful flowers of this hair wreath were created from human hair. 
A variety of twisting and braiding techniques with some added beads are secured by hand stitching. Judging by the variety of colors, the maker, Mary J. Black, likely completed this wreath with hair collected from many family and friends. Crafted in 1868, this hair wreath is from a turbulent and tragic era in American history. Mary J. Black lost several siblings to the sea, and no doubt she also lost people who she knew in the Civil War, which ended only a few years earlier. In the mid-1800s, there was a migration of New Englanders to the Midwest, suggesting she also may have had neighbors and family move far away. To our 21st century sensibilities, making a decoration out of human hair might sound, well, creepy. It's not something you hear or see very often today. Let's take a closer look. You can see the different colors of hair. There are many different techniques that Mary used to weave, braid, and knot the hair. She also added in several colors of beads. Mary J. Black was born in Frankfort, Maine, and was the youngest of the siblings to survive to adulthood. Her family members were mariners and farmers. After her father died in 1860, Mary may have moved with her mother to Belfast to live with one of her brothers. Less than 10 years after she created this masterpiece, Mary Black died of what was described as lung fever. It was likely pneumonia. Her death was recorded in the obituary notices section of Belfast Republican Journal, published March 7, 1877. Along with Mary's name and a mention of her mother, there was a poem. Like the painting of Harriet McGilvery Dunbar and the hair wreath Mary J. Black created with hair from friends and family, the poem in the newspaper remembered one that was gone and helped those that were still living to mourn. I will read the poem as we take one more look at the painting of Harriet McGilvery Dunbar. Father, thy chastening hand is laid in heavy weight upon each heart, and took our loved one to her rest. Alas, from her how can we part? No more she'll greet us when we come with joyous smile and clasping hand. No more her kind, unselfish acts in blessings sweet fall on our band. But then again, to her no more shall sickness come or sorrows frown. In faith and hope she bore life's cross. In peace and rest she wears the crown. Why should we weep for her, the true, the pure, the good, now glorified? Because she walks with us no more, life's changing values and streams beside. Blessed flowers of faith with fragrance sweet, guide to the home where she is gone. And Father, in thy boundless love, Teach us to say, thy will be done.